Is it historically accurate or just Hollywood magic? Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things hidden figures got factually right and wrong. Dear Lord, I don't even know where to begin. Oh, I'll tell you where to begin. For this list, we'll be fact-checking pivotal scenes and storylines from this 2016 drama. Number 10. The Timeline. Wrong. We can't fault them for this decision because it made the movie move at a much more exciting pace, but the creators of the film condensed many years of history into quite a short timeline. The Mercury Atlas space vehicle, which will put John Glenn, the first American, into Earth's orbit, has already undergone five unmanned flight tests. NASA has confirmed that the IBM 790 data processing system has been utilized to confirm all of the mission's launch and recovery system calculations. The film kicks off in 1961 and takes place over the following two years. But in reality, Mary Jackson became the first black female engineer at NASA in 1958, and Dorothy Vaughn made history by becoming a supervisor nearly a decade earlier in 1949. If you were a white male, would you wish to be an engineer? I wouldn't have to. I'd already be one. All three of the women had many career successes earlier in history, including authoring research reports. I will have you know, I was the first Negro female student at West Virginia University Graduate School. On any given day, I analyzed the bonometer levels for air displacement, friction, and velocity. In fact, the West and East computer divisions didn't exist by the end of the 1950s. Ladies. We've been reassigned. Leave your calculators, you won't need them where we're going. Number nine, the three women's closeness. Wrong. This leads to our next point. Starter is starting to make us late. We all gonna end up unemployed riding around in this pile of junk to work every day. You're welcome to walk the 16 miles. Oh, sit in the back of the bus. Because of the unrealistic timeline, the three main characters in the film, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Dorothy Vaughn, didn't actually cross paths as much as in the film. And they definitely weren't close friends who attended events for family milestones. Katherine, go find your way over there. That Colonel Jim is a tall glass of water. I bet he is. Tall, strong, commanding. Oh. This narrative change put the women together in a variety of scenarios where they actually wouldn't have worked together frequently. Emphasizing their closeness in the film let them express themselves to other women who were in a similar situation to themselves. But it's also not really true. All under 5'11", 180 pounds, IQ's over 130. Hmm. And handsome must be a requirement too. How could you possibly be ugly in these white men? Number 8. The Police Incident. Wrong. Considering the fact that the three women weren't especially good friends, it should come as no surprise that they didn't actually carpool into work together. Okay, try to turn it over now. Catherine? Mary! Somebody! Catherine, quit staring off into space and turn the damn car over. In one memorable scene from the film, we see them having car trouble and being questioned by a police officer when they break down on the side of the road. That's, that's some. I had no idea they hired. There are quite a few women working in the space program. When he learns that they work for NASA, however, he changes his tune and expresses respect for them. Woo! That a girl. We're all set. Well, hell, at least I can do is give y'all an escort. I imagine you're running late to work. Oh, no, so we wouldn't want to bother that you. That would be wonderful, officer. Thank you so much, sir. Follow me. I'm driving. Hurry up, Dorothy, before he changes his mind. We're coming. Hold your horses. All of this is fiction. And in fact, Katherine Johnson carpooled with her neighbor and fellow churchgoer Eunice Smith. Number 7. Katherine being told women aren't allowed in briefings. Right. In a memorable scene from the movie, Katherine asks for permission to attend a space program briefing. Why is it she can't attend? Because she doesn't have clearance, Al. I cannot do my work effectively if I do not have all of the data and all of the information as soon as it's available. I need to be in that room hearing what you hear. She's told by head engineer Paul Stafford, played by Jim Parsons, that women don't go to meetings like that one and that there is no protocol for it. There is no protocol for a woman okay, attending meetings. Okay, I get meetings. that part, Paul. But within these walls, who, uh, who makes the rules? When she pushes harder, she's eventually allowed to attend. This is how it happened in real life. And Catherine recalls asking if there was a law against women appearing at the briefings. 
When she found out that there wasn't, she managed to get her way. You keep quiet. Thank you. Number six, Kevin Costner's character, wrong. In the film, Kevin Costner plays Al Harrison, the director of the Space Task Group. And you figured all that out with this. Half the data's redacted. Well, what's there tells a story if you read between the lines. But in reality, Harrison was not a real historical figure. The movie's director wasn't able to secure the rights to portray the real person he wanted to, so created a character who was a composite of three different NASA directors. Similarly, Jim Parsons' character Paul Stafford wasn't real, which is for the best considering his racist and sexist attitudes. Computers don't author reports. Finally, the woman that Kirsten Dunst played, Vivian Mitchell, is also a fictional creation. I hear the IBM's up to full capacity. You certainly have a knack for it. My father taught me a thing or two about mechanics. Number five, getting rid of the segregated toilet. Wrong. In one of the most satisfying moments in the movie, Kevin Costner's character dramatically smashes the sign for the quote, colored ladies bathroom. There are a few problems with this scene. First, Kevin Costner's character didn't exist. And second, segregation ended at Langley in 1958. Some critics argued that this created an unnecessary white savior moment. There you have it. No more colored restrooms. No more white restrooms. The movie's screenwriter and director, Theodore Melfi, countered that, quote, there needs to be white people who do the right thing. There needs to be black people who do the right thing. And someone does the right thing. Go wherever you damn well, please. Preferably closer to your desk. And so who cares who does the right thing as long as the right thing is achieved? Here at NASA, we all pay the same color. The critics weren't impressed. Number four, Katherine Johnson computing John Glenn's trajectory. Right. John Glenn's orbit of the Earth made history in 1962 when he became the first American to do so. In the movie, we see Catherine working on Glenn's trajectory, which was totally accurate. Okay, so that puts your landing zone at 5.0667 degrees north, 77.3333 degrees west, which is here. Right here. Perhaps more surprising though, is that when the IBM computer seemed to be giving them inconsistent numbers, Glenn really did ask for Johnson specifically to check the figures for him and said that he was willing to fly that day if she confirmed them. We're on the same page, John. Our guys are on it. Let's get the girl to check the numbers. The girl? Yes, sir. You mean Catherine? Yes, sir. The smart one. I mean, she says they're good. I'm ready to go. Margot Lee Satterley, the author of the book Hidden Figures, said, quote, So the astronaut who became a hero looked to this black woman, in this still segregated South at the time, as one of the key parts of making sure his mission would be a success. I like her numbers. <laughs> Number three, Catherine running half a mile to use the bathroom. Wrong. Where the hell have you been? Everywhere I look, you're not where I need you to be. It's not my imagination. Now, where the hell do you go every day? To the bathroom, sir. To the bathroom. To the damn bathroom. For 40 minutes a day? One of the main devices used to expose the racism of mid-20th century America was the fact that Katherine Johnson had to walk half a mile to another building in order to use the colored bathroom. But in fact, it was Mary Jackson who encountered this problem, not Johnson. There's no bathroom for me here. What do you mean there's no bathroom for you here? There is no bathroom. There are no colored bathrooms in this building or any building outside the West Campus, which is half a mile away. Both had started at Langley before the NACA became NASA, which saw segregated facilities abolished. However, Catherine actually hadn't realized that the East Side bathrooms were segregated and used the white bathrooms for years. There was a complaint at one point, but she ignored it, and there were no consequences. So, excuse me if I have to go to the restroom a few times a day. Number two, Catherine's experience with workplace racism, wrong. While in the movie, Catherine takes a stand against the segregation at NASA, the real Catherine has stated that racism didn't affect her much in her workplace. My uniform 
skirt below my knees, my heels, and a simple string of pearls. Well, I don't own pearls. Lord knows you don't pay colors enough to afford pearls. When she spoke to WHRO TV, she said, quote, I didn't feel the segregation at NASA because everybody there was doing research. You had a mission and you worked on it. Mm -hmm. And it was important to you to do your job mm. and play bridge at lunch. <laughs> Perhaps to reflect practices elsewhere and to make the movie more dramatic, the film creators included it anyway. They've never had a colored in here before, Catherine. Don't embarrass me. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Segregation Laws at Langley Right. In 1943, when black women began working as computers at Virginia's Langley campus, segregation was very real in the state. I'll check her credentials. Didn't think I'd come all the way down here. It was mandated that there be separate workspaces, cafeterias, and bathrooms for black and white people. We don't want any trouble in here. Oh, I'm not here for any trouble, ma'am. What are you here for? A book. You have books in the colored section? As Hidden Figures author Margot Lee Shetterly describes it, quote, even though they were just starting these brand new, very interesting jobs as professional mathematicians, they nonetheless had to abide by the state law. The reality is, though, that segregation ended at the Langley Research Center when NASA was formed in 1958, which was before the movie takes place. Separate and equal are two different things. Just cause it's the way doesn't make it right. Understand? Yes, Mama. You act right, you are right. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.